Welcome to River of Life Online. My name is Brent Hudson. I'm the pastor of River of Life Church. I'm glad that you've joined us here today. We are continuing our series on Lead Me, Lord. And today we're going to be looking at the idea of discernment with the message of discerning God's guidance as we look to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Well, we're going to jump into our teaching time now, but before we do that, let's just pray together that God would speak to us and open our hearts to hear. God, we thank you for your presence with us. Uh, we thank you for your spirit that opens our hearts and our minds, and we ask that you would do just that in these moments as we hear from your word. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's go to our teaching time now. As we go through this series, we've already covered a lot of things about the errors that we can fall into as we, uh, as we try to do, figure out what God is saying. And, and then we've looked at the importance of continuing in this seeking of God and this idea of God wanting to lead us. And as we continue this week, I want to jump in and talk about discerning God's guidance. And we're going to be using for our passage today a short section of uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. But I'll be referring to the larger passage. I mean, it is a long story, so I don't want to read the whole thing here today. But uh, I do want to grab a snippet of this, which highlights uh, the main points that I want to draw out today. Today's message is called Discerning God's Guidance. Let's read from 1 Samuel chapter 3. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time. And once again, he went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. 1 Samuel 3, 6-9. Uh, once again, we're drawing on a story from the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, to illustrate an important principle about guidance. Now, the principle is a very important one, and we see it illustrated in the New Testament as well. But it's so clearly uh, seen in this story with young Samuel that we chose it as our starting point for this week. The principle is that when it comes to God's guidance, we all need help. That's the big idea. Every message has one big idea. That's the big idea for this message. If you don't remember anything else of what I say, remember this. When it comes to God's guidance, we all need help. It's kind of funny, really, that the simplest ideas are often the hardest ones to put into action. I don't think there's very many people who would disagree with the big idea that we all need help figuring out what God's saying. But then when we look at our lives and our habits, sometimes you'd never see evidence for that belief lived out in a daily way. I mean, how many people have trusted uh, voices in their lives that they regularly go to for spiritual guidance and help? Now, of course, there's some that do, but, but I think most Christians, particularly Protestant Christians from the Western part of the world, resist the idea of someone telling them what to do. It's kind of like the person who goes and buys uh, something from Ikea and uh, eventually in their you know, assembly puts the instructions beside and just says, I'll figure it out myself. Now, I mean, that's not to say that there aren't those who'd be able to do that, but there's always going to be something that comes to us that we just don't understand. There's going to be moments when we really do need someone else to help us. Now, the thing about Ikea furniture is that it's quite obvious whether or not you actually figured it out on your own. Uh, but with God's guidance, it's a little bit less clear. When I was uh, younger, I played in a bunch of bands. And some of these bands played rock and roll and radio hits. And, and then, of course, as a Christian, I began to, to play in Christian bands. And one thing that they all had in common was amplification. We loved it loud. And uh, now I'm here, a little older, and there's a range of sound that I simply don't hear anymore. And I think sometimes in our spiritual lives, the same thing happens. This world is playing so loud over and over and over uh, in our lives that sometimes we just get 
maybe a little tone deaf to some spiritual frequencies that God is uh, speaking to us on. Uh, maybe God, uh, maybe we're having trouble hearing God lead us into generosity in our lives or, or being gracious with our criticism or forgiving those who've hurt us. I mean, we all have pockets of blindness or deafness in our lives. You know, it's a truly blessed person who knows this and finds helpers to, uh, for them to, to help hear those tones that they have sort of lost uh, their hearing for. You know, what kind of person do we need to be once we accept that we all need help discerning God's guidance? Let's look at the story today and look at some things through the eyes of Samuel and then again through the eyes of Eli. And so first, let's start with Samuel, and let's look at Samuel's reality. So what is his reality? Uh, well, we know from the beginning of 1 Samuel that his mother, Hannah, left him at the tent of the meeting to be raised by the priests of God. And as we get to chapter 3, uh, we have this clue to the entire story in verse 1, where it says, The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. What's interesting here is that the word for rare is more often translated as precious, uh, but the, it's the idea of preciousness because of rarity, like a precious stone or a precious metal. It's this idea that it's valuable because it's rare. And the same word actually is used in 1 Samuel 18 to describe David's fame in the sense that he was a, a one-of-a-kind a man in in Israel he had he had some great skill that made him one of a kind uh, the writer of the story is very skilled and there's all kinds of literary connections as we read through it uh, we read that Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle with the lamp of God and then we read that Eli's sons were sleeping with women who served at the tent of the meeting uh, the same word in Hebrew is used to mark the faithfulness of young Samuel and the wickedness of the sons of the high priest Eli. We read in verse 2 that Eli's eyesight had grown dim. And that same Hebrew word has actually two very different meanings. One is like here, to, to grow dim, and the other is to reprimand or to correct someone which is used in verse 13, where Eli receives judgment from God because he didn't repri uh, reprimand his sons for their sinful behavior. I mean, these aren't subtle hints at, 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 by any means. You know, the author is making it very clear to us who the hero is in this story. The author is using every literary uh, bit of skill they have to tell this story so that we, the reader, uh, get the point that prophecy was rare at this time in Israel, and that the high priest was old and lacking moral courage. But as we read in the text in that first verse, the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And I think there's meaning behind that. There's, there's hope as we read this text that God is still present with Israel and that he will speak again through his prophets. Uh, but what I wanna draw out today specifically is that the person who would become the, the kingmaker and the, the prophet of Israel didn't know what he was doing. God was speaking, but Samuel needed help understanding what was going on. Three times God called Samuel's name, and he got up and he ran to the priest, uh, Eli, thinking it was he who had called him. Uh, and now, granted, we can cut Samuel some slack. The text says that he didn't know the Lord, which in this context, and clearly states, that means that he hadn't received any messages from God. He didn't have any experience with God speaking to him. Uh, what was happening to him was just outside of his frame of reference, I guess. And, and at least to me, uh, it makes the story and the sanity of Samuel even stronger. I mean, let's be honest. If a boy's out playing in the yard and someone calls his name, should the very first thought that goes into his head be, God must be speaking to me? I mean, of course not. Uh, and so we can cut Samuel a lot of slack in this story. Now, eventually, after three times of being woken up, Eli finally catches on. He realizes what was going on. Now, remember, the word of God was rare, and Eli probably had only heard stories of God speaking in this way. Uh, but with the knowledge that he had, he guided Samuel on how to respond and what to say. 
Samuel needed help to understand what was happening, and Eli was there to direct him. Now, of course, the word of the Lord to Samuel turned out to be judgment against Eli and his sons. And how is he supposed to go back and tell Eli that? Uh, you know, the words that he had heard from God. Eli had essentially raised him since he was three years old. And so later in the story, after he receives this judgment um, from God, Samuel, about Eli, it says in the text, Samuel was afraid to tell Eli what the Lord had said to him. But Eli called out to him, what did the Lord say to you? Tell me everything and may God strike you and even kill you if you hide anything from me. Uh, you know, I guess the first word to mind is harsh, right? But, uh, you know, despite all the faults of Eli, uh, he instructed Samuel on the importance of speaking the truth about God's word. And Samuel, even though he was afraid, he told Eli everything. Samuel humbled himself and did what God told him to and what his spiritual mentor demanded of him. Samuel, Samuel did what he was afraid to do. He spoke the truth. He knew even at a young age that people would far rather believe a happy lie than be confronted with a difficult truth. And yet Samuel told the truth and Eli immediately knew it was from God because the words that Samuel spoke matched the the man of God and the judgment that was given there in chapter 2 to Eli. We can all find an example in Samuel. Uh, You know, the prophet who was willing to humble himself, even to a person who was morally flawed, and, and learn about God's guidance. And the spiritual lesson for all of us uh, is that we need to humble ourselves and follow directions from those who know more than us. Even those who may have glaring faults, those people can be used by God to help us if we humble ourselves and truly listen. Now let's flip this over. What was Eli's reality? How do we see things through his eyes? Well, the reality for Eli is ultimately a dismal one, isn't it? Um, He's getting a word of judgment spoken against him. But still, even in the midst of this, he gives us some insight on on, on this idea. Um, On the one hand, he gives us a negative example. We can learn a lot from Eli's life from a negative example. We learn that we should never turn a blind eye to evil, that we need to correct those who are under our care and our authority, because when we do so, it protects them as much as it protects us. How will people even know what the righteous path of God is if nobody's willing to point out what it is? We learn that to put God first in our lives, it's going to require some courage. Sometimes we have to correct and and risk a relationship uh, to do that thing that God has called us to do. Now, it's easy for us to judge Eli Uh, You know, we just look at him and we say, why didn't you be stronger? Why didn't you show courage? Um, But the fact is, is that showing courage is a common struggle for all of us. And I think that's why we just love those stories that demonstrate courage and and why we, we need reminders to be courageous. The church needed a reminder when Saul, the persecutor, uh, met Jesus and became who we know as the Apostle Paul. Everyone in the church was afraid. Nobody wanted to reach out. Uh, Even the person who did reach out to Paul was at first hesitant. Uh, But God told Ananias, go and pray for Saul. And despite his fear, he did what God said. Ananias had a crucial role, but then he just fades out. We don't hear much more about him. Now, in his vision, uh, God had told Ananias that Paul was chosen to do something very important for Christ. And also, uh, let's just listen to the words of Acts 9.16. God says, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. See, Paul was the main character. Uh, Paul's story was the main storyline. Ananias was playing a supporting role, and he was okay with that. Now, in our story today, Eli, he'd made lots of mistakes, and God was going to judge him for those things. But with Samuel, uh, he led him in the right path uh, to listen and to be truthful, to speak the entire word of God, how it was delivered, even if it was hard to do that. Uh, He did this even though he knew he was under judgment, because the man of God had already spoken to them. 
he, he did this even though God was speaking to a kid who really didn't know up from down. God had chosen someone else to speak to, not to Eli, who had spent his life in the tabernacle. No, to the young guy. That's who God was going to speak to. But to Eli, it was God's right to speak to whoever he wanted to and to do whatever he wanted to. And he humbled himself to that reality. And that's our lesson, isn't it? Sometimes we don't get the spotlight. Sometimes God's light is shining on someone else, and our role is to support and encourage them to get their part right. What matters is God's purposes, not our glory. Eli, for all his faults, got that, and, and, and he helped Samuel on his path, first as a priest and then as a prophet. Eli teaches us that God sometimes chooses someone else for the big role, and we need to humble ourselves to support God's call in their life. So Samuel's reality is to be humble and, and receive help from whoever God sends, even flawed people. Eli's reality is to humble himself and to support what God is doing, even if he got passed by and passed over after years of investment. It's God's plan that matters, not ours. We serve God best when we understand this and when we humble ourselves before God. And so it, finally, I guess we come to what's our reality? You know, how can we take the lessons of Samuel and Eli and incorporate them in our own lives as we seek God's guidance for the future? What are those places in our lives where we maybe have grown a bit stubborn or maybe even self-righteous? Uh, will we take advice from someone who's flawed? Uh, you know, in our, in our heads we know that everyone's flawed, but can we humble ourselves even when those flaws are obvious and problematic for us? Eli clearly wasn't a role model. His sons were abusing their authority, stealing parts of the sacrifices for their own food, and engaging in sexual sin with those who were under their authority. And, and all the while, Eli just turns a blind eye, probably because he was being well fed. A point that the writer really draws out in chapter 4 when Eli finally dies under the judgment of God. You know, the writer tells us that Eli was blind, old, and fat, and, and that he and his sons died on the same day under God's judgment. We, we have in Samuel a clear example. Uh, he was inexperienced, but yet willing to learn from anyone who could teach him. He didn't think of himself as too good to receive help from Eli, despite his faults. And from Eli, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to help someone else succeed, even if it means that we sort of exit stage left in our own role, so to speak? Are we people who see the main thing as the main thing, to prioritize God's guidance and plan over the particular role we get to play? Can we humble ourselves and help someone else, even an inexperienced person who clearly doesn't know what they're doing? Can we learn from these examples today as we seek God's guidance in our own lives and in the life of the church? The important question for each of us is simply this. How can we humbly help each other discern God's guidance? Let's pray together first with our set prayer that we've been using throughout this a series, and then I'll close us with a final word of prayer. Let's pray together. Holy and sovereign Lord, here am I. Grant me the curiosity and courage to make new choices when you seek to guide me. Help me to truly seek you and find your way. Lead me, Lord. God, we pray for your guidance in these days. We look ahead and uh, our vision doesn't seem to go out very far. We don't know what lies ahead. And so, Lord, we ask for your light to shine. That truly, Lord, you would speak to us. That you would bring people into our lives to help us discern what you are saying. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and to understand that it's your will, not ours, that really matters. Help us to understand that you have already planned things out and we, we need to, to figure that out and align ourselves with your purpose and your plan. And so we pray, God, that you would give us ears that hear and that you would give us hearts that are wide open to what you are saying. 
And so help us, God. Help us to hear you. Lead us, Lord. Amen. Well, that's it for today. Uh, thank you for joining us here at River of Life Online. I look forward to being here again next week as we continue in our series, Lead Me, Lord. Until then, may God be with you. Relevant, practical, authentic, River of Life.